So good afternoon. I am Andy Rich. I'm Dean of the Colin Powell School, which is the School of Social Sciences here at City College. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, which is our seventh annual Sternberg Family Lecture. Today we have the American Idea with Eric Liu. I, I want to begin by extending my sincere thanks to Cy and to Lori Sternberg, who are with us today. Cy Sternberg graduated from City College in 1965 and he has never stopped giving back to his alma mater. For many years, Cy was chairman and CEO of the New York Life Insurance Company. During his tenure there, the company set up what is still to this day the largest endowment gift to the Cold Health School and one of the largest to the college, focused on supporting students and leaders working on emerging African-American issues. And this lectureship is fully sponsored and made possible by the Sternberg family. So Cy and Lori, thank you both for supporting our work and for being with us today. Last year, our subject was climate change. Before that, it was higher education, immigration. The Sternberg Lecture has become an important fall tradition here at City College. And I think there are three things, in my mind at least, that the Sternberg Lectures have in common year after year. First, these lectures are on complex, timely, and unsettled subjects. Topics that engage all sectors, all people, young and old, and that require the efforts of all of us to improve things. Second, these lectures are on subjects that cannot be reduced politically to simply Republican or Democratic, conservative or progressive solutions. We focus on topics that require engagement and efforts across the political spectrum. And then three, these are lectures on subjects that matter to us here on this campus, to our students, to our faculty, to our staff, to our alumni. On all of these fronts, I think our subject today could not be more on point. Election day is three and a half weeks away. We will begin early voting in New York on October 24th. Tomorrow, October 9th, is the deadline to register to vote in New York. For anyone not registered and or unsure whether you're registered, figure it out today. Um, today's talk relates to the elections, but it's just not about the elections. It is about the civic health of our nation, our ability to engage with one another and in ways that can lead to better decisions, and to stronger communities. That requires a whole lot more than voting from all of us. Our speaker today has thought as much as anyone in this country about what healthy and robust civic engagement can and should look like. Eric Liu is the co-founder and the CEO of Citizen University, an organization that believes that strong democracy depends on strong citizens. Citizen University inspires and it trains civic leaders in communities across the country. Eric also directs the Aspen Institute Citizenship and American Identity Program. He's the author of a number of books, including The Accidental Asian, Notes of a Native Speaker, and his most recent, Become America, Civic Sermons on Love, Responsibility, and Democracy. Eric served as a White House speechwriter for President Bill Clinton and later as Clinton's Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor. He has served as a board member of the Corporation for National and Community Service, the Washington State Board of Education, the Seattle Public Library, and Eric is a co-founder of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Eric and I got to know each other um, more than a decade ago. When I was leading a think tank called the Roosevelt Institute, he inspired me then, and he actually inspired some of our work there. And then we worked together in the years that followed when I was at the Truman Scholarship Foundation, an organization that was focused on trying to get young public service leaders to be more engaged in their communities. He himself is a Truman Scholar and he gave me a lot of advice and frankly engaged with our scholars on how to get them more involved as leaders in their community. He's become a friend um, and he's somebody who reminds me with all of his work about how all of us can make a difference, um, something that could not be more important at this moment. Before I turn it over to Eric, one small surprise for him. Um, Eric went to college at Yale and we're joined today by CCNY English professor and the director of our honors program, Geraldine Murphy. And she was one of your creative writing professors at Yale. And she is, I will tell you, almost as excited as I am to have you speaking here today. Um, and then I have to say, Eric gave us a surprise uh, earlier today when we learned that his mom took night classes at City College in the early 1960s, soon after she came to the United States. So, um, so Eric knows this place, and it's just a real pleasure to have you with us today. Eric's going to share remarks for about 15, 20 minutes. Then we're going to have plenty of time for q and I want to encourage everybody to make use of the chat. Please share your questions there. My colleague, Debbie Chang, who's our Director of Fellowships and Public Service Partnerships, is going to assist me with the Q&A period. So throughout the talk, feel free to share in the chat. 
um, we are very privileged to be joined today by CCNY's president, Vince Boudreau. President Boudreau will make closing remarks and we look forward to that. And lastly, we're recording the conversation so those who can't be with us can watch it later. Everybody's been muted. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to Eric. It's all yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Andy, my goodness, thank you so much for that uh, welcome and introduction. Um, thanks to President Boudreau for uh, um, convening us and closing us out later. And uh, thanks to the uh, Sternbergs as well for making it possible for us to convene here and for really setting an example of what it means uh, to recognize that um, even the most successful people know deep down that there's no such thing as a self-made man, that we're made by our institutions, we're made by our commitments, that we're made by the ways that we keep a sense of connection to the places that shaped us. And uh, uh, you all have been living it uh, as a family and uh, the Colin Powell School and, and City College uh, are, are great beneficiaries. Um, I'm also just uh, thrilled uh, to see at the bottom of my Zoom screen, Geraldine Murphy. That's just amazing. Hello and uh, English 120 uh, from, uh, <laughs> uh, from so many years ago, uh, fall of 1986 maybe. Um, it's, it's great to see you and, uh, and I know in chat, absolutely, no such thing as a self-made woman either. Um, uh, I, I'm just uh, so grateful to be um, with you all today. And um, as Andy mentioned, um, I, I have a very strong sense of personal, um, not exactly homecoming, but uh, connection uh, to uh, City College uh, and to the Colin Powell School. Um, as Andy mentioned, my mother um, came to the United States in late 1959. Uh, and almost immediately, because she was on a student visa, she started taking classes and she went uh, at night to City College uh, taking English English classes. And during the day she found jobs as a babysitter, as a file clerk doing other things and uh, making her way in New York. And, uh, um, and that really is the beginning of her American story uh, and therefore the beginning of mine. Uh, I ended up growing up uh, being born and raised in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York uh, uh, in the outer, outer suburbs uh, of the city um, and feel deeply connected to um, to what the city represents and embodies. And uh, uh, the other thing, knowing that I was coming to speak uh, um, not just at City College, but at the Colin Powell School, um, and to recognize the kind of distinctive nature of this institution, I went down to my bookshelf and found my mint uh, hardcover copy of Colin Powell's uh, 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 autobiography from 1995 uh, called My American Journey. Uh, and uh, it's a great book if you haven't read it. Uh, uh, and still timely. And there are two things that are kind of notable about it uh, that relate to what I want to share today. Um, one is that his very first chapter, um, he titles uh, Luther and uh, Ari's Son, uh, which uh, is how I actually want to begin um, my remarks today. Um, I am uh, the child of immigrants, uh, the child of Julia Lu, uh, the child of Chao Hua Lu, my father. Um, and uh, what I am also is a child of the American idea. Uh, and when you are, uh, as I am, second generation, uh, born the child of immigrants, uh, you know, I was raised in an environment uh, where an ethos was very palpable, even if it was rarely spoken. And the ethos was this, uh, that I had done nothing uh, except have the dumb luck to be born here. <laughs> that it was my parents who'd had uh, the great struggles that they'd made, the hard choices, they'd done the heavy lifting. Um, and so the implicit question throughout was, what was I going to do to earn it? What was I going to do and how, I, how was I going to be uh, to make those choices, to make that risk, to make that leap uh, worth it? Uh, and I've devoted a great part of my um, adult life and career, um, not only in a general sense, uh, trying to be of use uh, to my country, but in particular, trying to explore the meaning of this country and the idea of America. And that is the topic that I wanted to explore today. As, as Andy said, um, I've had a chance to work in politics and government, both in Washington uh, and now in the other Washington here in Seattle, where I've been for the last 20 years. Um, and I would say that as much as uh, my bio always emphasizes the fact that uh, you know I worked for President Clinton, was later appointed by President Obama to a federal board, um, frankly, the deepest part of my education uh, as a member of civic life, uh, as a citizen, um, has, been in a, has been rooted here in Seattle, uh, being a contributor to a real place, a real community, uh, to 
the life of a city and the texture around you, uh, that isn't theoretical. You see what happens when you show up. You see what happens when you don't show up. Uh, and I don't have to tell those of you who are connected to the greatest city in the world, New York, uh, but I know from chat that uh, we're joined by people literally around the world. I was just seeing in introductions, Madrid, Oakland, you know, uh, Queens, you know, all, <laughs> all these places that uh, uh, far from the epicenter of uh, the campus uh, and yet so connected still by this sense of a shared uh, identity, uh, a shared ideal. And to me, what I wanted to explore today are three different ways to understand the American idea. And that is to understand both what it is not and what it is. And I wanna say a few words about each of those three angles of entry into this big vast topic, um, and then uh, open it up for true conversation uh, that can take the form of Q and A. Um, if you're moved to wanna to share something, um, uh, that, that's fine too. Um, so the first thing that I wanna say just about the American idea uh, is this. Uh, we have a notion in American life that what it means to be American most fundamentally going back to the founding of this country uh, can be encapsulated on that um, colonial era, revolutionary war era flag that says, don't tread on me, which in modern terms is step the heck off, back off, right? I get to do what I want. And when we say in vernacular conversation, it's a free country, uh, what we mean is nobody gets to tell me what to do, right? Don't tread on me. And that is deeply ingrained as part of one version of the American mythos and the American self story, but it is not in fact a proper understanding of the American idea. If you go all the way back to the founding and the revolution and you come to this very moment that we're in today, a moment not only of dealing with pandemic, a moment not only of dealing with um, a great and overdue reckoning um, with the deep structural uh, injustices uh, of every institution in the United States around race, um, that from the beginning to the present day, uh, liberty properly understood is not a matter of mere encumbrance from restraint. Liberty properly understood is responsibility. Freedom means actually free to bear a burden. Freedom is about re recognizing that there is, as I said earlier, not only no such thing as a self-made man or woman, there is no such thing as actually being unencumbered. That is a dream state, a fantasy state that only two kinds of people really indulge in. Toddlers, because they don't know any better, and they don't want to abide by any rules, and sociopaths. And I think one of the things that we've got to emphasize right now is that in this moment in civic life, we have a lot of people behaving both like toddlers and sociopaths. And in our work at Citizen University, the, the nonprofit organization that I, that I co-founded, we emphasize all our work is about fostering a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship. And I wanna take pains to say that when I say Citizen University and citizenship, I am not talking about documentation status. I'm not talking about whether you hold US passport, whether you have the papers, where you were born. I mean this deeper ethical sense of being a member of the body, a contributor to community, someone who recognizes at the end of the day, in a way that again, this pandemic is teaching us and reminding us over and over again, that there is no such thing ultimately as someone else's problem. That privation, pain, a, a vulnerability to infection over there in that part of town is right quick gonna get to your part of town. That there is no severing off someone's suffering from your own privilege and that to actually hold together a free society, one in which we do get to enjoy certain blessings of liberty and pursue our own dreams and, our, and try to fulfill our own potential in the way that my mother did when she arrived in this country, the way that Sai did uh, when he enrolled at CCNY. To do that is to recognize that liberty is responsibility. It means taking responsibility for the sustaining of this fragile experiment. That this thing is not a perpetual motion machine that runs itself. No democracy is, no functioning system is. This requires us to show up in new ways. And so if you think about the, I can't believe I can even use the word controversy, the controversy that still, per, still persists about whether or not it makes sense to wear a mask in a time of airborne pandemic. That is not a controversy rooted in science or public health. That is a controversy rooted in a warped notion of the American idea. That is a controversy that emerges from this idea that to be American means don't tread on me. Nobody can tell me whether I should wear a mask. 
Well, maybe that's true. But everyone can and should tell you that to be a grown up in a community means you can't go infecting people left and right. You have to take responsibility for yourself and the environment around you. And that brings me to the second dimension of the American idea that I think is worth naming. And there's both a myth and a reality. And the myth is that America is all about rugged individualism, right? What is City College but one of the great incubators of immigrant success stories? Still one of the country's best engines, actually gardens of social mobility that can be found, right? But even as we celebrate that, we have to be mindful of the ways in which so many forces in, in American life want to tell that story as the story of a single lone rugged individual who pulls himself up by their own bootstraps. And I could tell the story of Julia Liu, of my mother, uh, as a hardworking uh, person who arrived here alone. She did arrive here alone. She had a couple hundred bucks in her pocket, and that was it. And she sold the one thing she had, which is a camera, so she could buy a winter coat. And I could tell a story about how with grit and perseverance and her own gumption, she made it in America. And yeah, part of that is true. But literally from the minute she arrived, she was held by others. She was brought and folded into a weave of relationship and obligation. And some of that was other immigrants and their families. Some of that was professors who looked after her. Some of that were her first bosses when she was a file clerk. Actually, Cy Sternberg and I were talking before the event started about how he grew up in Brooklyn. And in spite of that, was a Yankee fan. Uh, and uh, I grew up a Yankee fan, but in spite of that, I still have a soft spot for the Dodgers because one of my mother's first bosses in the United States uh, when she got a job at a company, a coffee company called Chock Full of Nuts, uh, which I think still exists, at least in New York. Um, one of her first bosses there uh, was an executive, a recently retired uh, professional athlete by the name of Jackie Robinson. And uh, Mr. Robinson, as she knew him, um, was one of the kindest people in that office. And he saw this young, kind of scared immigrant woman doing you know, clerical work there. And he told his secretary, keep an eye out for her. Make sure she gets around here. Make sure she can navigate things. Make sure um, you know, uh, pe people don't do her wrong here. And it was never anything as active as mentorship. Uh, but for a brief moment, uh, their lives intersected. And for a brief moment, someone looked out for her. Right? That is not a story of rugged individualism. That is a story of how Jackie Robinson himself, a lone hero who was held by so many others and preceded by so many others before he integrated Major League Baseball, recognized that he had to pass it on. And the way that we think about this is that instead of rugged individualism, it's recognizing that in fact, in a society that works, we're all better off when we're all better off. If this is not about me and me making it and me getting what I can, it's about recognizing that when we all thrive, we all thrive. And that again, our fates are entwined here. And to put it in other terms that um, you know, maybe bounce off a different set of myths uh, about, about kind of the cowboy uh, individualism. Uh, you know, we think about rugged individualism in terms of the West and the frontier and the cowboy populating and settling the American West. And, you know, we edit out plenty of things from that story, like the taking away of land and the genocide against Native Americans, like the enslavement of Africans uh, to work that land. But the thing that we also forget is simply this, rugged individualism never got a barn raised. So yeah, you can strike out on your own and take risks and have gumption. And all of that is hugely important and part of the American spirit. But when it comes time to do something that is not just about you, raising a barn, draining a swamp, clearing a field, building a building, creating a great education institutions, we do it collectively. We do it together. And every great thing that has happened in America and every great thing that has made this country great happened because people joined together as part of a group. The third and the final dimension of the American idea that I wanted to speak to today, um, both in myth and reality, is this idea that is, has become painfully uh, and distressingly prevalent again uh, in American life and in our discourse. And that is the idea, this kind of dream that it's possible to purify America. And the way that this comes out is in so much sentiment, political rhetoric, and outright uh, state action that is anti-immigrant. The idea that immigrants are bringing impurity to the American body. Immigrants are bringing disease. They're bringing weird ways of thinking and being. They're bringing terrible mores and social habits that will corrode and erode the American way of life, right? 
And throughout this country's history, that narrative has, you know, come in sine waves and it's risen and it's fallen, but it's on a rise right now. And there is this background noise, this background story that still pretends that this is a country that can achieve some kind of racial purity. And whether you're talking about immigrants and anti-immigrant sentiment, or you're talking about the, the reckoning that has been uh, set in motion, uh, well, set in motion by the killing of one after another after another unarmed black citizen in the United States, but then turned into a social movement by Black Lives Matter, we are in a time right now where people are recognizing that the myth of America as a pure nation, the myth of America as a place that is primarily uh, a white country is just that, a myth. Just around the time my mother arrived in the United States, James Baldwin was in a little village in Switzerland. And he, he wrote an essay later uh, called Stranger in the Village. Uh, and in that essay, there's a line that has always haunted me. And it's haunted me not only because it's true today, because it was true prophetically even then when he was writing as an expatriate, looking back at his, at his still segregated United States. And the line was this, America is white no longer and it will never be white again. He knew it then, we don't yet know it now. And so much of our politics is about the turbulence of that denial and that reckoning. And what we have to recognize that is that to say that America is no longer white is not only to recognize statistical demographic fact, it is to in fact recognize that America from the beginning has never been just white. That so much of what has made our society, our culture, our food, our music, our holidays, our habits, our social norms has been about not purity, but about hybridity. That America is the hybrid nation. And that is both the hybridity of all kinds of different immigrants, but it's the hybridity of the ways in which Africans enslaved here brought together and fused different traditions, different voices, different ways of being and catalyzed and alchemized the incredible suffering and turned it into a source of resilience that itself is part of the American DNA now. And the same is true of the story of the native peoples of this land. From the beginning, American character has been hybrid and it always will be. And there's a very simple, concrete way to think about this in these times, because in these times where everything, everything's gotten globalized, and I don't have to tell folks at City College, you are, you are the world, right? This is one of the most diverse student bodies on the planet. And you recognize and embody something that, you know, there aren't a lot of places either in the US or on planet Earth where you'd have a student body or even a Zoom room like this, as diverse as this. And why is that? It is because the American idea properly understood is not about purity and exclusivity. It is about hybridity and inclusion. And the way to put it simply is this, as a son of, a, of Chinese immigrants, I think about this a lot because China is rising. China is growing strong. Someday pretty soon, China's GDP will surpass that of the United States and we will no longer be number one economically. That's just a matter of kind of mass and physics, right? But even when that day comes, I do believe that this country will retain a deep and enduring competitive advantage if we don't blow it. And the advantage can be summarized this way. America makes Chinese Americans. China does not make American Chinese. China is not interested in taking people from Africa or Oakland or Latin America or uh, you know, Paris or whatever, and having them come to the territory of China land there, make their way there, learn Chinese ways, and be able to claim over time that they are now Chinese. That's not their operating system. They are in fact about purity there, bloodline purity, civilizational purity. That's the way they, they roll. And fundamentally over time, there are some strengths to that, but that is ultimately a deep liability in a globalized age. We make Chinese Americans. And as long as we don't blow it, we keep on making Chinese Americans. We keep on making Jamaican Americans like Colin Powell. We keep on making Haitian and Venezuelan Americans. We keep on making Belgian Americans. We keep on making every flavor and form of American. We keep on elevating every tribe of Native Americans. And we claim this place. And that is something that people in other countries don't know how to do and don't want to do. So these three dimensions of the American idea, that liberty is responsibility, that we're all better off when we're all better off, 
and that our deepest strength lies in our intentional committed hybridity, these are things more than ever right now that we've got to commit to as citizens in that deepest ethical sense. And when we do that, we've got to remember that neither our problems nor the things that will solve them began yesterday. We have inherited so much that is good, bad, and ugly in this country. And this time of facing ourselves and facing our history is a time where we have to recognize that there is memory that precedes us. And there is lineage that is, again, something both to be proud of and something to face honestly with a measure of regret. I am the child of Julia Liu and Xiao Hua Liu, but I am the product of Ida B. Wells. I'm the product of Wong Kim Ark, the Chinese laborer who brought a case to the Supreme Court in 1890 and established the principle under the 14th Amendment of birthright citizenship, that those persons born and naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States. I'm the product of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. I'm the product of Grace Lee Boggs and Ella Baker. I'm the product of Dolores Huerta. I'm the product of Reggie Jackson and Captain Kirk. I am a living hybrid and embodiment of all of these sources and ways of being and ways of moving the world. And they all get expressed in an American vernacular. And so are you. I don't care what your passport says. If you're in this room connected to City College, connected to a conversation about the American idea, so are you. And that sense of commitment to memory and to our influences and to what shaped and made us is something that we now in turn have to pass on. The United States, for all its manifest failings, remains in my view, and I'll use this word guardedly because I know it's loaded, remains exceptional. Because we are still trying to be planet Earth's first successful mass multiracial democratic republic. Mass multiracial democratic republic. Plenty of other countries and societies have tried two or three of those marks, a mass multiracial dictatorship, a mass democratic republic, but all racially homogenous, right? A small, homog a small uh, heterogeneous democratic republic. No one's hit all four of those marks. We're giving it a try. We're still giving it a try. We're still failing. And the idea of the American idea is that there is a creed of liberty, equal protection of the laws, opportunity for all. There's a creed that is still worth living up to. There's a creed still worth striving for. There is no Chinese creed. There is no Indian creed. There is no German creed. This creed is both an exceptional inheritance and it works an exceptional burden upon us. And so we today right now have to vote, if you can, with a ballot, but to quote Emerson, have to vote with our whole influence, with our voice, with our ability to invite people into new conversations, with our ability to organize and mobilize people, with our ability through example and through exhortation to get folks to take responsibility for the body politic, which is ailing and unhealthy now, but can be redeemed and renewed. We've got to do that. And we are the best examples for how to do that. We, Colin Powell, we, each of you in this room, we, the Sternberg family, we can do it. We will. And when we do, we will be the latest embodiments of all that is powerful and blessed about the American idea. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be with you. And now very glad to just open up conversation and share more with you about uh, the work we're doing at Citizen University or anything else you might like to talk about. But thanks again uh, to the Colin Powell School and to the entire community for joining today. Thank you, Eric. That was wonderful and inspiring. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are starting to get questions over in the chat, which is fantastic. And I and I want to turn it over to my colleague Debbie Chang in just a minute. And but but Eric, can I invite you first to tell us a little bit about your work at Citizen University? Because I think you know your your talk um, provokes this question of so how do we do it, and um, and how do we how do we move this project forward in our communities where we live? And would love to hear a little bit about your work and and what you would encourage us to do. You bet. Um, so our work at Citizen University, as I said earlier, is about culture building, um, and you know, we live in a time right now where there's a lot of conversations about structural change, right? To our healthcare system, to our economy, to our taxes, um, and all that matters. I used to work in policy, I get structural change. But our philosophical view is that culture precedes structure. Culture, by which I mean the norms, the values, the habits, mm -hmm. the narratives, the stories we tell about who we are, 
all of that frames up what's possible when it comes to structural change in policy. And so Citizen University's work takes the form of several different programs. Probably our best known one uh, is something called Civic Saturdays. Civic Saturdays are these gatherings that began here in Seattle four years ago and have now spread all across the United States. And what they are is basically a civic analog to a faith gathering. It's not church or synagogue or mosque, but it has the arc and the flow and the feel of such a gathering where you enter into a room and you're invited to sit down and you sit, turn to a stranger next to you and you'll be asked to each speak about a common question that is deeper than small talk, a question like, who are you responsible for? Or who have you failed lately, right? After that, you might hear some poetry. You might hear readings of texts that you can think of as American civic scripture, texts by an Ida B. Wells or by a uh, Martin Luther King or by a Chief Seattle, uh, whoever it might be. Uh, and then we'll sing together. We'll rise and do a thing that Americans don't do anymore. And that is actually to sing and vocalize our collective power. There's a civic sermon at the heart of it that someone will deliver that helps make some moral sense of the crisis we're in and what we can do. And then people after this form up into civic circles to actually convert that awakening and motivation into action in their community. And Civic Saturdays have been spreading uh, partly of their own accord, partly because then we created a new program called the Civic Seminary. Uh, and Civic Seminary is training people from tiny towns and rural places to uh, Brooklyn, Queens, East LA, you name it, uh, Dallas, uh, to lead these gatherings for their own people in their own places and communities. Um, we're now designing a new program uh, that you can think of to extend the metaphor as a civic confirmation program uh, in which young people, uh, in a circle of young people guided by elders, go through an arc of civic spiritual formation, uh, culminating in a rite of passage like a bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah or church confirmation. Uh, we call that program Citizen Redefined. Um, so those are some of the programs. And we've also been doing something um, that I think is, uh, and so number one, I wanna invite everybody who's here to join us at a Civic Saturday, if this sounds interesting, um, to apply for our Civic Seminary. Um, we're doing cohorts on pretty much a rolling monthly basis and training people around the United States. Um, and, uh, but the other thing we're doing now, um, we've been practicing something, and Andy, you've been part of this so over the years, called the Civic Collaboratory. And the Civic Collaboratory, you can think of as a nationwide mutual aid club. Mutual aid has gotten kind of uh, uh, popular these days during the pandemic because all kinds of communities are figuring out, nobody's coming to save us. Government can't get its act together. Um, you know, I've lost my job and so businesses aren't there and workplaces aren't there. Like we, we the neighbors, we the people have to start figuring out how, how to help each other. Um, and so you see all these mutual aid efforts sprouting up around the country. Well, we've been doing this mutual aid club for nine years or so. Um, and we're now spreading it in different domains and places to kind of train people in the practice of mutual aid, by which we mean simply making commitments to each other, right? commitments of help. We, we have a format at the heart of the civic collaboratory that is adapted from a practice in many immigrant communities. It was a practice in uh, going back 150 years in many communities of recently liberated, formerly enslaved African-Americans, where you didn't have, you yourself didn't have a lot of money capital. And so what you did is you got a circle of people together to put their small amounts of money into a common pot. And then over time, you all took turns getting the pot in order to help launch your business, start your venture, do your thing, right? And we have basically adapted that format so that every time we meet four or five members of this group in this network, present to the full group a project they're working on, some civic endeavor they're doing. And the rest of the group offers not critique, not commentary, but hard commitments of help, investments of relationship capital, idea capital, institutional capital. Yeah, sometimes money capital, because there are funders in the room too. But what we're doing is building a muscle that got atrophied in American life joining clubs, staying in clubs, and supporting each other in clubs. You know, we used to do that as Americans in over 50, 60 years, we've stopped doing it. Nothing like a pandemic to remind us, hey, it's kind of helpful to know people in clubs and to make commitments to each other. So that's another program that I would mention to, to folks uh, um, as either something that you want to check out, but also something to, you know, steal at will. <laughs> Take this social technology and adapt it to your own circumstance. Uh, I see in chat people are asking how to join. Um, take a look at our website, citizen, citizenuniversity.us, um, and I'll put it in chat in a moment. And um, you know, you'll see a whole range of programs that we do. Um, the last one, Andy, that I'll mention, 
because it also speaks to these tensions that, that we are experiencing in our politics right now, um, is a project that we're running out of the Aspen Institute, um, which is a DC-based uh, policy uh, and practice think tank. This is a project called the Better Arguments Project. Um, and the premise of the Better Arguments Project is that, you know, as much fighting and toxicity as there is in American politics right now, we don't necessarily need fewer arguments in American civic life. We just need less stupid ones, right? And, uh, and I don't mean to be glib, less stupid means a few things. It means arguments that are more rooted in history. And so you know actually where we came from and things didn't begin yesterday, right? Arguments that are more um, emotionally intelligent where people are coming in knowing their own patterns of how they get their buttons pushed uh, and knowing the ways in which they're uh, actually gonna likely to push other people's buttons. And arguments that are also honest about power recognizing that you don't come into an argument about inequality on an equal footing necessarily. If you're calling for rent control and, and a developer isn't, uh, you're in different postures of power. Uh, and you gotta be able to name that fact uh, when it comes to uh, having better arguments. But the central principle of better arguments is, is this, when you take winning off the table, amazing things can happen. If you enter into a civic argument, not to win, but simply to understand. Like, I'm not trying to change your mind. I just truly want to understand your worldview. Where are you coming from? How did this get formed? Why do you see the world this way, right? Not so I can trick you and fool you and recruit you to my side, but just so I can understand. What that does, well, one thing it does is it makes it possible the guy might actually change his mind. But more deeply, uh, fundamentally, what it does is it rehumanizes our arguments. In our culture right now, online and offline is one of deep, relentless, weaponized, marketized, commercialized dehumanization. We've got to rehumanize. We've got to see each other. We've got to ask to be seen. And uh, the Better Arguments Project is one other set of tools. And if you go to betterarguments.org, you'll find all kinds of tools, trainings, free workshops that you can join uh, as well for, for that. So thanks, Andy. I, I went on at length there, but I, I did. Uh, I am glad to tell people about some of the concrete ways they can get involved and put some of these ideas about the American idea um, into everyday practice. Thank you. Let me turn it over to Debbie Chang to, to pull some questions for us, because I'm, I'm glad to see so many good questions over here in the chat. In the chat on this notion of rugged individualism that you brought up, which uh, Farhana points to, for example, points out that it can allow people to ignore other people's suffering. And Gabriel notes that it fosters the centralization of power and wealth. So why is this ethos so pervasive and how do we redistribute power and wealth for all to thrive? Mm. Well, that's a good two part question. And you know, I think part one um, is that you know, this country was born in rebellion against tyranny, right? And so, um, uh, and so that does um, you know, translate often to a, uh, taking a collective don't tread on me ethos, uh, very individual and uh, making it very personal. Um, and I think because there has been, um, uh, at least for um, you know, some in this country's history, um, a pathway of mobility uh, for, you know, and that kind of classic, uh, even if it's overtold, uh, immigrant narrative uh, of arriving here and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, um, there is some truth to that, right? If you arrived in this country, uh, particularly from Europe um, a century ago, um, it wouldn't take long for you to A, become white rather than Romanian or Lithuanian or Polish or Greek or Italian. You just got to become white. And what that meant was not black, not Asian, right? And once you entered the club of white, anything was possible in America, right? Uh, and that narrative unfolded in a way in all our institutions, education and business um, that reinforced um, a dominant story of this is a country, a land of opportunity, right? It has in fact been a land of opportunity if you had the good luck to be in those circumstances. Um, you know, thank God my mother arrived in 1959 rather than 1859, because in 1859, she wouldn't have been so welcome. Uh, and a generation later, she would have been excluded by law from the territory, right? Um, and so I think our, our recognition um, is that a lot of the way that rugged individualism arose as a myth um, has a lot to do with the ways in which whiteness um, became a substitute for Americanness in our national self-consciousness. Um, but I think to the part two of the question, so how do we more widely circulate power? Um, and I choose a word very carefully. I don't mean, I don't say redistribution because redistribution feels 
like a one act transaction, which I take from the rich, subtract their wealth and give it to the poor, right? Now, there may be a single such moment where through higher taxation or whatever, there is that kind of shift in balance. But I say circulation in the same way that when we speak of blood in the body, we speak of circulation, right? In the United States in 1980, the wealthiest 1% of Americans accounted for 8% of national income. Today, that same 1% accounts for over 22% of national income, right? So we've had 40 years of concentration of wealth, 40 years of public policy that was driven to reward the already privileged with more privilege. And if you think about it in terms of a unified whole body, imagine if 22% of my lifeblood was in my pinky, in this 1% of my body, right? For a while, the pinky would be thinking, man, times are flush. This is good. I'm living, man. This feels great, right? But within a pretty short order, first of all, that pinky would fall to the ground because the arm would not be strong enough to hold it. And then pretty shortly thereafter, the rest of the body would start failing and organs would start failing because you can't have a quarter of your blood in your pinky and have the body live, right? If we circulate, the whole body can thrive. The pinky can get great circulation. The pinky can get you know, more than 1% share, but the body has to live for any part of the body to thrive. And in the end, we are of a body. And that is true of an economy, that is true of a democracy, that is true of a neighborhood, it is true of a city, it is true of a community. And so how we shift this to recirculate wealth and power begins again with narrative and culture and the stories we tell. That there is a story in America that, uh, that prosperity is a trickle-down phenomenon, that a few super rich people, if we just reward them enough with low taxes and low regulation, that their prosperity will leak its way down to everybody else. No. The great driver of prosperity, the true source of enduring prosperity is a robust middle class in this country because for a very simple reason, when workers have more money, businesses have more customers and you set in motion a positive feedback loop of increasing demand and increasing opportunity. The body thrives when that power is circulating. We've got to tell a different story about this. Uh, that story then makes it possible for people to contemplate different policy choices, right? So that when you think about what it would look like to invest in healthcare for all, you don't just have a reflex of, oh, that's communism, that's socialism. You have a reflex of, yeah, that's taking care of basic needs so that someone doesn't have to go bankrupt and maybe die in order to actually raise a family if they get sick. Taking care of basic needs so that someone like a young Julia Liu, like a young Cy Sternberg, can actually develop to the fullest of their potential, right? And that is both a matter of, that is a matter of culture precedes structure, narrative precedes policy change. And we've got to tell a different story in order to make a different story happen uh, in our politics. And by the way, obviously I'm a Democrat, I've worked in progressive causes, but I don't think Democrats or progressives have, have a monopoly on the solutions here. And, and nor do uh, uh, all of their solutions uh, work. Uh, you know, I think part of what we've got to do um, is have what I think of as binocular vision uh, about how to solve some of these problems and to understand what are the good ideas that are coming from a more free market oriented uh, conservative worldview about how you stimulate enterprise, about how you actually activate uh, a spirit of initiative and, 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 and opportunity seeking um, in order to create and generate new opportunity and wealth and couple that with a sense of mutual responsibility so that we don't leave folks behind so that City College is stronger, so that the city of New York is stronger, so that the United States is strong. Um, that's what we've got to do. Along those lines, um, to what extent does capitalism corrupt democracy? And is a separation between money and politics a viable solution? Um, capitalism inevitably corrupts democracy, but any, any, any economic system is implicated in any form of governing. Um, the danger and the risk of capitalism um, is that left to itself, right? Capitalism, like any complex adaptive, adaptive system, uh, leads toward more and more clumping and concentrating of resources. This is just nature, right? Those of you who are gonna walk around campus this fall, you'll see leaves blown around the campus. And after a while, left to themselves, those leaves magically are gonna clump in one corner 
uh, of that plaza, right? That is the way systems work. And, and so the key phrase there is left to itself. That's what the system will do. Uh, and as Farouk is saying in chat here, there have to be checks and balances. Regulation is not killing capitalism. Regulation, regulation is making sure that you can make the best parts of capitalism work without capitalism killing itself and everybody around it, right? And so our responsibility is to recognize that yes, left unchecked, that system leads to a concentration of wealth and power that is inimical to the principles of democracy. Because democracy is based on the theory and the premise of equal voice, equal vote, equal say. And the more that money distorts voice and power and clout, uh, the more it becomes difficult to sustain uh, that promise and more that promise becomes a fiction. Um, over the last two or three years, I've had the good fortune to co-chair uh, a commission run by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences um, on the practice of democratic citizenship in the United States. And we came out this summer uh, with our report, a set of recommendations uh, for how to reinvent our democracy. Um, and a chunk of those recommendations uh, run up against uh, the realities of money and politics. Uh, and so um, although many of our recommendations are about things that everyday citizens can do um, in their communities to reinvigorate a sense of responsibility for the health of our democracy, um, some have to do with just outright changes in the rules to limit the influence of big money in politics. 160, 170 years ago, um, the national political debate was dominated by what was called the slave power, slaveholding interests. And that wasn't just literally the slaveholders on plantations in the South. That was cotton mill owners in the North. That was the banks in New York that were financing the slave trade. That was this incredible lattice work of institutions and systems that all made their money off of slavery one way or another, right? Today, we don't have the slave power, but we do have the money power. We have the ways in which concentrated wealth is protecting itself and reconcentrating wealth. And we're living in a time right now where we've got to be able to check that, not because of socialism, not because we hate success, but because we want everybody to have a fair shot at thriving and, success and succeeding so that we can actually sustain the title of that report that we did, Our Common Purpose. I actually have a copy of it with me right here. Um, if you go to the American Academy, um, uh, if you just Google American Academy of Arts and Sciences and Our Common Purpose, um, you'll see that report and some of the recommendations we make. But um, uh, yeah, I think um, I see some other questions in chat. You know, why would a billionaire, why would a billionaire yield uh, their billions? Right? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe some are philanthropically and altruistically oriented, but you can't count on the goodwill of a few uh, nice billionaires. This is where public policy does matter. Um, and it mattered in the, in the New Deal, and it mattered in the Great Society, and it mattered in the other direction in the Reagan Revolution, and it will matter again, um, because we're entering, I believe, a second progressive era uh, in the United States. And we're going to have both a culture change and a structure change coming, um, and a norm change. Um, those of you who are in business, um, you know, Sai, you can talk about the ways in which, you know, when you first entered into the world of insurance um, and you looked at your counterparts on Wall Street, places like Morgan Stanley, they were partnerships where people had equity and they looked out for the long-term health of the institution. And they were not trying to make a quick buck. They were not trying to screw and fool customers. They had a trust relationship and they understood that what goes around comes around and you got to run this business in a way that's going to endure. It's the way you ran New York life, right? And unfortunately, that ethos has become more of a minority ethos uh, in our business culture, where it is much more about maximize shareholder return, maximize quarterly uh, returns, get the here and now, get what you can uh, before the merry-go-round stops. Public policy is one thing that will change those norms because it will change behavior just the same way that narrative and culture shift will change those norms. We got to have that one-two punch of culture and structure um, so that you don't have to count on the goodwill of a nice billionaire. You just have to recognize that this is the way grown-ups behave when they're rich in a free, healthy society. So there are many excellent um, questions in the chat that I'm not going to be able to get to, but I want to make sure to get to um, a question from your former professor, Geraldine Murphy, who taught an essay from Accidental, Accidental Asian in her Immigration and Migration Seminar. Um, and she asks, have you thought of the rural urban divide as a tension of these two embodiments, individual and collective? Mm, fascinating question. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's complicated that way. We, at Citizen University, um, we do a lot of work uh, actually since 
uh, even before the, the last presidential election, we were doing a lot of work not on the coasts, uh, not in elite, elite uh, cities, uh, but throughout the Midwest, throughout the South, um, in rural communities. And I think a lot of rural communities um, pride themselves on a memory of collective action, on a memory of barn raisings, on a memory of being in it together. But a combination of global capitalism and um, you know, social change, um, to say nothing now of the response to that through things like the opioid epidemic, um, you know, has decimated a lot of these rural communities in a way where um, they have fallen back to a uh, false gospel of individualism. Uh, they have forgotten what once made you know, uh, those rural communities sustainable. Uh, they were not sustained by a bunch of lone wolf cowboys shooting each other. They were sustained by people pulling together and looking out for each other. And they've forgotten that. And, and it's understandable. And it's understandable in just the same way it's understandable in the greatest city in the world, right? Just because New York is a city doesn't mean that everybody there is collectively oriented and pulls together all the time. We do after disaster. We did after 9-11. But on any given day in New York, you're, put, you're shoving someone else out of the way so you, you can get on the subway instead of them, right? <laughs> it's not like city dwellers are any more collectively oriented and you know, uh, oriented toward the common good. Uh, it's more that we as a society right now are living in a time where, again, our leaders, elected and not elected, our popular culture, glorify hyper-individualism, glorify the self and the me. Social media makes this worse. It allows and enables everybody to pretend they're their own little miniature celebrity. Me, 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 me. Me doing impression and management. Me showing my best life on Instagram, right? Who cares? Your best life is not you. Your best life is not depicted if it's just a picture of you. And that is a phenomenon that has uh, corrupted both rural and urban communities. But I think there's something sad and tragic in a lot of rural communities because uh, they once knew better and they once had something to teach a lot of uh, uh, urban, uh, a lot of city dwellers uh, and, and, and they've forgotten that. But I think part of why I, I am still net hopeful, uh, even though there's so much that is broken and painful in our country right now, because it is in small towns in the United States um, that I see a lot of renewal happening. Uh, my friends, Jim and Deb Fallows, um, who are great writers uh, uh, for the Atlantic Magazine, wrote a book a few years ago called Our Towns, uh, where they flew around to tons of small, medium-sized cities around the country that aren't part of the daily news, that aren't part of um, the national political conversation. San Bernardino, California, and Scranton, Pennsylvania, and you know, smallish places. And they found that in these places where people aren't doing the posturing of MSNBC or Fox News, they're just trying to figure stuff out. They're just trying to make a town work. Um, and for all that is broken, they're taking responsibility for doing that, right? And I, I take that book as great evidence uh, that in both rural and urban America, um, there is a great civic awakening underway. Um, and we who've gathered here, um, wherever you may be living, are, are, are part of that. And uh, you know, I see in one of the folks here, uh, you know, having a little child in your lap, a, a little toddler there, you know, this is a multi-generational uh, endeavor that we're part of here, right? And, uh, um, and so I, I think the urban-rural divide um, has more to do with, um, uh, the last thing I'll say about this is as someone who lives in a city, but has many friends in rural areas, uh, my first boss in politics was a senator from Oklahoma, uh, and so I came to understand, um, you know, deep things about a, a, a political culture that is rooted fundamentally in the rural. Um, and that is, in rural America right now, you feel very painfully something that is everywhere in the United States, and that is a feeling of being disrespected. There was a very interesting set of polls done by a group called More in Common recently that's looking at the left-right urban-rural divides. And one of the most interesting findings of this poll was that all Americans, urban or rural, black or white, rich or poor, in the United States right now, feel disrespected. We all feel disrespected. Now that's weird, right? <laughs> right? What, what does it say about our culture and our society where everybody is feeling disrespected? It means that, again, we are not seeing each other. We are not feeling each other. We are not trying to actually step into the shoes, the suffering, the aspirations, the ambitions, of another. 
And that makes people respond reflexively when they hear Black Lives Matter to say, well, all lives matter. Because they take the statement Black Lives Matter to somehow mean my life, if I'm not Black, doesn't matter. Rather than actually trying to understand what would lead someone to have to say that Black Lives Matter. It must be that since time immemorial in this country, our institutions have made Black life matter less or not matter at all. I hadn't thought about that. Wow, why would they have to say that? rather than just reflexively say, well, all lives matter, blue lives matter, my life matters, right? Everybody feels disrespected. And paradoxically, the way out of that, even though you want satisfaction and respect, the way out of that is to remember that it's not about you. But we've got to learn, you know, <laughs> let me close with a New York note. To quote the great philosopher uh, from TV, Tony Soprano, um, <laughs> if you want to get respect, you got to show respect. And uh, <laughs> Uh, we've got to learn a habit of being willing to see, rehumanize, respect the other, respect the people we disagree with, respect the people we fear, try to imagine what drives them, try to imagine what shapes them. And then, yeah, it'll come around and they'll see us in a different way. I don't care. I do care who's going to be president uh, next year. I care deeply, but it doesn't matter. On this level, no president can fix this for us. Presidents can do great harm. The president alone cannot heal this level of humanity. It's on our willingness to see that urban rule is not a divide uh, of the hands, it is a divide of the heart. Um, and it's a divide that we can face within ourselves first. Um, I, I'm, I'm will, I, I know that, uh, Andy, you uh, said we'd go an hour here. Yeah. Um, I, I'm willing to stay longer if, 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 if you want to, but I also want to respect everybody's time and, and commitments here. Well, I appreciate it. Let, how about I suggest we do one more question and then I want to turn it over to President Boudreau. And uh, Debbie, do you? All right. So there, there are a set of, yeah, there are a set of questions around the rise of nationalism and nativist rhetoric, rhetoric in the US and abroad. Um, so first, is there anything in the nationalist agenda that could be defensible? And what uh, beyond that, what is the best way to combat this other than voting? And how do we call out the wrongs that we see in our communities without otherizing and eventually demonizing those who don't see things the same way? By the way, I just to say, these are great questions. Um, thank you for this such thoughtful engagement and, and, and questions. And um, so uh, part one, yeah, Kazi, nice. Uh, I like that question, that's yours. Uh, um, uh, there is something I think defensible uh, in the idea of nationalism. Uh, and that is that um, people in the end, humans, though we are part of the human race, humans are wired to belong to groups and to make meaning as groups. That's just the way we are, right? And until the day that kind of Mars attacks <laughs> and, and, and makes all humans realize we're on the same team, uh, we are going to have an impulse as humans to see the world and try to filter and sort the world into an us and into a them, right? That's number one. So therefore, the reflex that many of my friends on the left often have to want to go to a um, global cosmopolitanism. I'm a global citizen. You know, sure, it's important to recognize that there are many problems and uh, like a pandemic, uh, or climate change that are global, that are transnational, that do not respect national borders. But as we're also learning during the pandemic and during climate change, when you are suffering through a health crisis, for instance, who are you going to petition for help? You're not gonna go to the World Health Organization to petition for help. You're gonna go to, in our case, the United States Congress and say, hey, how about creating a program for healthcare for all or health insurance that's accessible for all, right? Nation states have moral agency because nation states remain a locus where action can be taken on behalf of a community. The globe isn't that, right? And this nation state has a particular obligation for the reasons that I was saying in my lecture, that this nation state based on a creed is in theory open to all and in theory kind of made manifest by all. And so, the part of nationalism that I think, of the nationalist politics that I think those of us who are fearful of it need to actually take a dropper full of it and put it into our own political worldview is recognizing that most humans want to belong to something. Number one, most humans want to be the hero of their own story. Number two, right? 
Uh, white nationalists don't go out there. Those, those kids carrying torches in Charlottesville did not think, yeah, I'm an evil Nazi, right? They're telling a story that says, I'm saving civilization. I'm the hero here, right? Everyone wants to be the hero of their own story. And so recognizing that as a matter of psychology then means, okay, well, what do you do with that? Then we create a bigger story of us. How do we create a bigger story of us? One that can actually activate this sense of belonging in a way that is inclusive and not exclusive, right? And the way that I think we do that, and this is the nature of our work at Citizen University, is to speak a language not of tribalism and not of um, narrow ethnic parochial nationalism, uh, but what you might think of as civic religion. We are a nation bound together by a creed, by an idea, by a belief. And democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. It's that simple, right? It's not a matter of the electoral college or you know, uh, what, how a ballot is printed. That, that's just the technical aspects. When we all stop believing that this thing works, it's gonna stop working really quick. But as long as we sustain a sense of belief and possibility that it can be responsive to our needs, that as frustrating as it can be sometimes, we can actually move the dial, that we can get our voices heard, then it will in fact become responsive. It will in fact become those things. And that's a form of civic nationalism that here in the United States, we can and must practice in the ways that I was describing earlier, in an inclusive way, in a way that is collectively oriented, in a way that is about responsibility taking rather than responsibility shirking, right? That kind of civic nationalism in the United States is not only possible, it's more necessary than ever right now. And we who are alive and awake right now at probably one of the two or three biggest pivot points in the history of the United States, um, we can't be spectators. We have to be co-authors of this moment. So if you can, vote, get registered, show up at the polls, vote early. If you can't vote, show up a hundred different other ways. Tell everyone you know who can to vote. Organize people to start caring about their neighborhoods. Organize people to, in forms of mutual aid to help each other and rebuild that civic muscle, that citizen muscle of holding communities together, right? That's our responsibility now. And if we live up to that, we will create a sense of us, a bigger sense of us. And the great thing about a civic notion of us and them is that at any, any moment, at any time, one of them, one of those sociopaths, one of those people who's just selfish, one of those people who won't wear a mask, one of those people who's just you know, cheating on taxes, one of those people over there, at any moment, one of them can become one of us simply by choosing to live like a citizen simply by choosing to open and change their hearts. It's not a matter of blood. It's not a matter of religion. It's not a matter of where they were born. That them can become us. And our job, who are in the us, is to keep on inviting and invite with open mind and open heart relentlessly and with an eye toward what is possible and beautiful here in the United States. And what is possible and beautiful is embodied by City College and the Colin Powell School. And again, I just want to thank the whole community uh, for bringing us together today. Eric, thank you so much for inspiring us and for helping us to recognize our power and not feeling powerless at a moment like this. It's it's inspiring and give give us a real sense for where we should go. I want to want to thank everybody for their questions, and I want to turn it over to President Vince Boudreau, thirteenth president of City College of New York, and uh, my predecessor as dean of the Colin Powell School. Thank you, Andy. And I, I, I am Andy's predecessor, but what a lot of people don't know is Andy was my close collaborator in the early years of the Colin Powell Center. And, and one of the things that came out of that collaboration before he, for a time, left us for, for, for other work was the Colin Powell Center's commitment to service learning and public service on top of the work we were doing in student leadership development. And that's, that's a legacy that when the Colin Powell Center became the Colin Powell School, that was one of the things we brought to social science education. And it's one of the things I brought from the Colin Powell School to City College leadership. So there, there is a legacy here that goes from this institution, Colin Powell School, Andy's role in it, our collaboration through to City College. And I wanna say that, that, that the other person that's been involved in that arc from the very beginning and continues to be involved is Cy Sternberg as a board member, not just of the City College Foundations, but also of the Colin Powell School now and, and, and the Colin Powell Center. So, so you, are, you are at um, 
a moment in what has been a, a, a fairly long arc of programming around um, these issues. Eric, that was spectacular and, and, and just exactly what we needed in this moment. I, I will admit to feeling a little bit of, of, of disorientation at, at listening to you here, uh, listening to you talk about the, the need to renew American life by this, this sense of civic togetherness and, and, and being directed towards our community. L looking on the one hand at you know, the 130 some people that were on this talk and, and sort of flipping through the pages, seeing so many old friends who I haven't had the chance to sit down and, and share a meal with or a conversation or just, just the pleasure of, of physical proximity to in, 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 in so long. Um, knowing that that we isolate not just as an act of self-preservation, but as an act of collective responsibility to one another, the wearing of the mask, most of the masks we wear do a little bit to protect us, but mostly they protect the people around us. That that act of, of personal discomfort in the spirit of altruism, I think is very much where we are. And 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 so on the one hand, because of where we are in the pandemic, this tension between being together and serving one another and, and being apart is really manifest. And of course, it's also grounded in a moment in our history when um, even if we were together in a room thinking about the drift of our politics over the last decades towards individualism, um, your talk would have been absolutely uh, what we need. And so it was, it was doubly uh, refreshing and, and, and inspirational. I want to I want to thank you for it. Um, in these thoughts of, of where we are in our public life and our public policy, I am inevitably um, driven back to thoughts of my of our beloved college, City College. And, and a, a, only a few days ago, Andy asked me to speak in a seminar that he's running at the Colin Powell School for first time students, you know, uh, fresh people, I will say, and transfer students to, to ground them in, in their city college experience by talking to them about the history and the legacy of, of this institution, public education generally, and in particular talking about the way that students have through the years been empowered by their time at this place. And one of the questions that came up, um, and it's one that echoes through the conversations I have all the time with alumni is, you know, why did it used to be free to come to City College? And now why do we have to pay tuition? And I see a lot of you um, nodding your head, some of you maybe who were the beneficiaries of free tuition and some of you shaking your heads, some of you who are the uh, bear the responsibility of paying tuition. And there's lots of ways to answer that question, right? I mean, one of the ways uh, to answer it has to do with budgets and the crisis we're in now and, and what it costs to run a university and all of those are valid questions. But in my response, I always go back to something that's, 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 um, that operates at a higher level than that, which is how as a society over the last decades, we've come to think about the relationship between our collective responsibility to support public higher education and what we get from it. And it is absolutely unambiguous that there was a time when as a people, as a society, we understood public education as a public benefit. Clearly, we knew that we would be more stable, more democratic, more prosperous, all of us together. If people who had children or went to private school or, or were done with their education, nevertheless acquiesced to the support of institutions that educated, here's that phrase from our, fun, from our founding again, educated the whole people. And we did it at City College better and for longer than anyone else in the country. And somewhere along the line, the idea of public education as, as something we all benefited from, even if you never stepped into the, the, the campus of City College or Binghamton University or Michigan, University of Michigan, um, gave way to an insistent question of why should I contribute to this other person's education? We went from thinking about public education as a, from a, as a collective benefit to something that was a selective benefit to the individuals who went to campus. And, and so as, as, as I talked with the students, as I think about it myself, yes, we can 
operate at the level of public policy and specific programs to change the way budgets are allocated or or the way we think about public education but really and truly and i think this eric comes back to you know what i think is the clarion call of of, of your talk we don't get there unless at a really fundamental level we can begin to think about uh, our our relationship to a collective society that's dedicated to working together and pulling each other up um, and 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 that brings me back to the kind of experience I have looking at these screens of all of us individually hungering, I know, to be together in, in, in one form or another, um, staying apart, staying apart so that we can do something collectively that we couldn't do if, if we surrendered to the impulse of taking off a mask and sitting down together and disregarding public health rules. And, and so maybe um, in the middle of this hardship, we're at a point where we're at exactly the right time to think about at, a, at an ideological level or at a, at, a, at a, I don't want to say ideological because it gets us into left and right. And I think the thing that was clearest in what you had to say, Eric, is that this cuts beyond that. There are, there are, uh, um, there's an appreciation of communitarian values that, that crosses is the American spectrum and runs through our history. But maybe this is exactly the moment to begin to develop a recommitment to, to a collective concern for, for a community that will um, provide a framework for uh, a better day. And, 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 and I, 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 I fervently hope that's the case. I know that the work, Eric, that you're doing and, and, and the organizations you work with are pushing that forward. And, and I, am, I am proud that, that we are all of us on this call in a way associated with a college that has made that also its mission from, from, from its inception. Um, I, want, I, 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 I want, before the end of, of my remarks, I want to renew our thanks uh, to the Sternberg family, Cy and Laurie, for supporting both the college and um, this remarkable lectureship. This is a lectureship which year in and year out is the forum where on this campus we talk about the most pressing uh, issues uh, facing our society. And, and, and I, I think as we look back at, at these first um, oh, you know, brace of, of uh, Sternberg family lectures, we will think about this talk as, as really one of the very best that we've heard. So, so, so thank you, Eric. Thank you, Cyan and, and Laurie. Thank you, everybody at the Colin Powell School that made this possible. And to all of you from Spain to Alaska and the West Coast, I've seen you logging in. Um, what a remarkable assembly. Thank you for spending time with us today. Andy? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for giving us a path forward, both President Boudreaux, Eric, Mr. and Mr. Steinberg, uh, Sternberg, thank you for making this all possible. I wanna thank everybody for wonderful questions. This was as engaged a conversation as we could have. As Vince says, you know, it's not the same as being in a room and, and it's hard to look at each other through, uh, through, through Zoom, but we engaged with each other. We, we engaged with the ideas that we were sharing and this was a, a wonderful time and, um, and a way for us to move forward. So thank you all very much for your questions. Thanks, Debbie, Debbie. Thank, thank you for moderating them. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Eric. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. So great to be with you all.